Right, so this is the time for the series panel, the uh, panel about the regulations. So you're going to find out about the latest uh, Spanish regulations, but also they're going to touch about the new MICA, which is regulation in the EU. Um, and I would like to welcome the st to the stage uh, Marina Marquezic, <laughs> Isabella Delgado, Isabel? Raul Cal Calvo, Enrique Nieto, Sergio Gorjón, and uh, online is going to join us Ana Maria Martinez Pina, and now our wonderful uh, moderator Ana Anya Bly, who is the in-house lawyer in uh, doing good. She's going to introduce all our beautiful panelists and enjoy everyone. Good luck. Oh, do you need a chair? Oh, wow. Okay, let's get a chair. Oh, God. Which one? The last one? No. Okay. Oh, here. All right. Hello and welcome, everybody. It's good to see a big room of audience. Um, thank you for joining us on this wonderful panel today. Uh, my name is Anja Bly. I'm an in-house lawyer at Doing Good and the president of Blockchain Think Tank Slovenia. And I'll be having hosting this panel today with all these very important people. So let's first get to know everybody that we have. Uh, thank you for coming again. Please welcome Ms. Isabella Delgado, a commercial technician and state economist. Ms. Delgado currently works in the Technical and Financial Analysis Office of the Public Treasury um, as the head of the FinTech area, dealing with all issues related to crypto assets, cybersecurity, the digital euro sandboxes, etc. She's also a Spanish representative in the Council Negotiation for MICA, which is the market in crypto assets. We're going to be talking about this regulation quite a lot today. In addition to the FinTech area, she works in the Financial Analysis area of the Spanish Treasury and has actively participated in the public response to the COVID-19. She has previously also worked on competition issues at the CNMC, which is the Spanish National Markets and Competition Commission. Next, we have Enrique Nieto on my left from one of the most prestigious international law firms, Uria Menendez. Mr. Nieto is currently a partner at the firm's capital market practice area during 2011 and 2012. Might be a while back. He was seconded to the New York office his professional practice is specialized in advising on initial public offering, the IPOs, and stock exchange listing, rights issued, and offering of shares by listing, listed companies. Um, also, takeovers, bids, delisting, um, equity capital markets, etc. He also regularly advises clients, both issuers and investors, on matters related to the capital markets regulations um, and the corporate governance of listed companies. That also goes with the mergers and acquisitions involvi involving non-listed companies. A very warm welcome to you as well. Thank you. On his right, um, we have Sergio Gorjon, left, sorry, head of financial innovation division at the Bank of Spain, Banco de España. His team is in charge of monitoring and analyzing the nature and potential implication of merging financial service providers. Their task further includes assessing the regulatory challenges deriving from the digital transformation of the financial industry and advising on future legal reforms. Mr. Gorjon spent 20 years at the payment system department where, the, where he headed the policy and oversight division and dealt with many topics around innovations such as blockchain, crypto assets, instant payments, artificial intelligence, etc. Last but not least, Mr. Gorjon also worked for the work bank um, at the financial sector specialist and remains an external consultant to this institution. At the end, we have Raul Calvo Sanchez, a legal professional in the Web3 startups and new venture fields, currently in-house counsel for Entropica Labs. 
Mr. Calva Sanchez is advising on the relevant areas of activity of the DeFi startups, mainly software development related activities, company structuring, overall risk assessment, <laughs> digital asset regulation and taxonomy. Also DAO's legal frameworks and many other things. Turning now back to the ladies, we have with us Ms. Marina Markezic, who is the co-founder of the European Crypto Initiative, which aims to propel EU regulations to become DeFi friendly. Since 2017, Marina has been advising crypto projects on governance and legal matters with a focus on decentralization, DeFi and NFTs. She previously led the advisory team of Blockchain Accelerator co-founded and co-founded a crowdfunding platform. And now last but not least, we have Ms. Ana Maria Martinez Pina, who is joining us remotely via a video conference call. Ms. Mar Martinez Pina is offering advice on regulatory aspects of banks insurance companies and asset managers. Nowadays, she is especially active in FinTech and InsurTech, the new European regulation on crypto assets, MICA, and the activity of national and European supervisors in this area. Ms. Martinez has also been vi vice chair of the Spanish National Security Market Commissions. So a warm welcome and thank you all for taking the time to be with us here today. We have... <laughs> These are quite amazing profiles, um, and we do have quite difficult questions to be asked. So first, we're probably going to be focusing. Yeah. So I need to change. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you. All right. So back to the questions. Um, first, we're going to be focusing on the local grants. Since Ethereum Bar Barcelona is being hosted in Spain, we're going to be discovering what's happening here. So what are the laws, what are the regulations, what are the challenges, and how Spain is perceiving this space. And now we're going to be focusing on the industry, how, for example, the companies are coming up with all these legal challenges, how they are dealing with them. And then last, we're going to be focusing on the overall new regulations called MICA and finding out how this is going to be impacting all of you including me. All right, so first, crypto regulation in Spain. Um, now, we know that crypto has a history and is developing quite rapidly. Um, so we kind of want to understand um, for the audience as well, what are the current regulatory landscape? And we're more or less going to turning our attention to Ms. Delgada. Um, how do you see the ministry's role? Um, how do you see actually the role of Spanish Treasury? Is there uh, perception that crypto poses a threat? Is there a constant dialogue happening with the ministry? Um, are there any ongoing conversations? How do you see all this? Okay, so thank you for the introduction. Uh, I would also like to thank the organizers of this event because I do believe it addresses key issues uh, in terms of innovation in the financial sector. And these issues uh, affect us all. So it affects regulators, supervisors, the industry and consumers. And the time of this panel couldn't be better because as you all know, last week, we reached a political agreement on what will be the regulation in Europe uh, of reference for crypto asset markets, uh, MICA, and also in the transfer of funds regulation, which uh, from now on, uh, well, when it will start to apply to the transfer of crypto assets. So having said that uh, about how the Ministry of Economy and the Spanish Treasury, and I would say uh, regulators across the globe see the crypto assets markets because I do believe uh, regulators are quite aligned in this vision. Um, I don't want everyone to get into my neck, but I will be quite honest with how crypto assets are seen. Um, crypto assets presented themselves uh, as a type of asset that through the use of cryptography and the decentralization of technology allowed to achieve the creation of a financial system that worked without uh, centralized intermediaries. But, um, well, and the applications of this type of assets were uh, numerous. Their use as a medium of exchange, but also the use in more complex financial operations, such as credit granting, insurance, uh, investment management, etc. But as regulators, we have observed a different reality. What we have observed is that, well, uh, first of all, the volatility of these assets uh, calls into question of unbacked uh, crypto assets, 
calls into question their role as a medium of exchange. Uh, as a response, stablecoins came into the game, but uh, recent events, Terra and well, other stablecoins, have also proven uh, their, their inability to maintain their, a stable value. Second, in terms of decentralization, we have also observed that for the time being, real decentralization has also been quite limited. Uh, so this was one of the main arguments on, in favor of this ecosystem, the decentralization. But we see a lot of platforms operating uh, with centralized structures, but uh, without playing the rules of the game. And what does this mean? What does not playing with the rules of the game mean? It means that, for example, what happened some days ago, uh, some exchange, some service providers had to suspend their operations. And this, in the traditional financial system, will have liability obligations that are not happening in the crypto ecosystem. Uh, third, but uh, not least, we have also observed that um, there is quite a um, tendency to concentration in the market, both by miners, but also service providers. A recent paper by the International Bank of Settlements, uh, published a few weeks ago, uh, stated that this concentration and this market power that miners have leads sometimes to market uh, manipulation and uh, front running. And this type of conduct were also addressed uh, at the beginning of last century in the financial traditional system. So having said that, I don't want to hear everyone to hate me. Uh, as regulators, we do see potential benefits in the technology behind this ecosystem. Uh, not all distributed technologies work efficiently in terms of uh, timing, in terms of uh, scalability, environmentally, and I'm sure you've had loads of panels around uh, these topics, but there are other technologies that, uh, that bring to the financial system tremendous potential benefits. In terms of, for example, reducing cost, automatizing all the processes, and this is why we, we have also, we have during this time defended that an appropriate regulatory framework uh, is important to foster the benefits in the underlying technology. So in order to provide legal certainty and to provide consumer protection, a legal framework which addresses all those threats would also foster this technology. So we see here a trade-off with the regulation. Um, Having said that, uh, the regulation by reference, I don't want to get into it now because uh, we will be talking about it later. And it's MICA. Uh, MICA, it's like the fi financial regulation, but uh, it adapts itself to the <coughs> characteristics of uh, the different um, crypto assets markets. But meanwhile, in the meantime, in Spain, we have done and taken some steps and I would say there are two main rules in Spain if, uh, which address crypto assets markets. First, the uh, CIRCULA or the Securities um, National Commission, which addresses the advertising campaigns. And what it says in the CIRCULA is that advertising campaigns can not lead to fraud or to misunderstanding information. The information has to be accurate when you advertise crypto assets with investment proposals. And the second main rule uh, would be the register that is in the Bank of Spain for so certain service providers. So these are the two main rules, but uh, the, the full regulation is not complete without talking about MICA, uh, which will be the reference uh, regulation. So to sum up, I will not extend myself uh, lar larger. I would say that uh, the vision of regulators is uh, spurring this technological innovation and achieving that this technological innovation leads in potential benefits for the industry as a whole, for consumers, for the industry, for the providers, and also for the financial system. Mm. If I'm not mistaken, you just mentioned the Bank of Spain as being the one having the register. So we're going to turn our attention to Mr. Corhon. Can you expand on what is the current viewpoint of the Bank of Spain, for example? Um, how do they maintain the dialogue with the crypto um, overall, overall ecosystem? And is there any, for example, future orientation that you would like to emphasize as well? Yes, uh, thank you very much for having me here as well. Um, indeed, on top of actually running the register, as Isabella was saying, 
we set up a financial innovation division about four years ago, and the idea was to structure a more informal dialogue with the stakeholders of the fintech space, some of which would be from the uh, crypto space, basically. And this has changed a little bit the way that the central bank manages relations with third parties in the sense that it's an informal dialogue, so nobody is actually compromised by what they say. What we pretend by that is to have every interested party, interested party to call us and um, openly expose their concerns and their thoughts as to where frictions are. This is helpful for us in order to understand what we should be looking at. And at the same time, we also use those opportunities in order to explain why financial regulation works in a, center, in a certain way so that they may be able to accommodate in the future a little bit their business models. On top of that, we added to the toolkit that we are handling a couple of years ago, the uh, regulatory sandbox, which goes one step farther, I would say. And in that sense, it provides a testing environment, which is more formal of solutions, uh, a wealth with initiatives uh, that have been brought to the sandbox as of now, um, actually touch upon crypto assets. So it proves that initially it offers an opportunity for both parties to actually dig deeper into the understanding of how, how this works. And then on top of that, what we're doing is also engaging in a more broader dialogue with other financial regulators across the world, because as Isabella was saying, the both the understanding as to the concerns and risks of the markets, but also the opportunities are shared all across the board. Thank you very much. It's a uh, tough <coughs> word for the banks, as I understand. Um, we've been speaking a lot with the Central Bank of Slovenia, and it's quite a task. Um, turning from the regulators, perhaps, before we go to you, Ms. Martinez Pina, we're just going to be asking Mr. Nieto here um, about what is your experience, like what are the questions that the industry players, the companies are usually coming to your law firm with, um, how do you help them out, what are the most common questions perhaps, and <laughs> what do you see are going to be the regulatory challenges that we as company representatives are facing? Thank you, thank you, and thank you everyone for being here. I, I guess that what, what the, industry, the industry wants from us is uh, peace of mind. That's, that's what they look for. Uh, not many people look for it. Uh, what, we, what we feel is, uh, I mean, I was today here taking a look and, and I saw many players, we were discussing this before, we saw many players that maybe are carrying out activities which are already subject to regulation. And, and we see there's, there's many, many players in the industry, um, you know, uh, acting without, without uh, legal advice, assuming risk. And the ones that do come to us, uh, what, we, what we see, well, they want peace of mind, as I said. What we see is they are basically afraid of uh, two things. Um, and I, I want to throw a message here to the audience. They are afraid of uh, regulators. And you've seen they are quite nice people. Uh, they are really proactive. They are, they, they are really embracing this technology and, and this revolution. And they are also afraid of legal fees. And, and I, I, I can promise you that that's not that, uh, it's not that scary. Um, how can we offer peace of mind? Uh, well, the, the question we get the most is, are we subject to any regulation? Are we subject to liability? The problem with crypto assets, and I mean, I, I'm specialized in securities law, and I've been working with, with uh, crypto clients like for four or five years. Uh, the reason why, why we had to get involved is because uh, by nature, uh, a crypto asset falls within the definition of a tradable security. And that's the problem we have here in Spain. The, the legal definition, I don't want to get very technical, but the legal definition of tradable security is any representation of value, anything with value, that can be traded in an impersonal uh, exchange. So, so that's the problem we have. So the, the work we carry out with all our clients is to, 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 to somehow decipher what is the legal nature of the crypto asset at hand. Mm -hmm. So we do that. We, we, we see if, if, the, if the crypto asset falls within the financial regulation or not. Uh, we also approach the Securities Exchange Commission, and, and well, they are they are quite flexible here. They confirm whether or not our assessment is right, and then the clients are in a twofold world. They are either under the financial regulation umbrella, or they are 
in the uh, what the regulators call the, the Wild West today, which won't be the Wild West once Mika and all the coming regulation is, is enacted. So that's what we do now. We also offer a transversal, and that's something we, we, we all clients want. Uh, it is not just a matter of regulation. It is a matter of taxation. It is a matter of uh, anti-money laundering. And those rules are already in place. Mm -hmm. and, and, and crypto players are subject to liability here. So we offer that advice. Also in connection with the circular regarding uh, advertising and publicity. And, and that's, um, that's very new. That was enacted uh, just two or three months ago, um, and that's, uh, the scope is really broad because it affects any uh, anyone who is addressing the Spanish market, and the, the Commission understands that the Spanish market is being addressed if the, if the publicity is drafted in Spanish or communicated. So anyone uh, making an advertisement of crypto services, crypto assets in Spanish is subject to that regulation, and that's what we get now. Mm -hmm. Of course, when Mika is in place, uh, we'll, we, this, the, the scope of our work will, 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 will increase. We will need to issue legal opinions for the regulators. We will need to draft uh, white papers. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and obviously, our, our, our labor here, our, our job will be, will be you know, more, more, well, more um, uh, scope, uh, the scope of our job will be broader. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Makes sense. Thank you so much. And now um, towards Ms. Martinez Pina, thank you for being with us online. Um, with all your experiences and probably insights as well, we would like to hear from you. What are the regulatory aspects that you would like to be addressed more often? And how do you see the regulations might actually develop next? Um, and of course, any particular challenges that you also see? Okay, well, thanks a lot for the invitation. And I'm sorry not being able, for not being able to be in Barcelona with you today. So, uh, well, in Spain, certain regulatory aspects have been addressed. They have been mentioned by my, my colleagues, the, my two panelists, um, and especially certain regulatory aspects have been addressed by the CNMB, the Securities Market Authority, through the approval of a, of a circular on advertising of crypto assets presented as a means of investment, and also through certain criteria that have been uh, published by the CNMB and Bank of Spain. I would like to develop uh, a brief on the, on the circular and on the advertising of crypto assets. Uh, the circular establishes the rules, uh, principles, and criteria to which this advertising activity must be subject. subject. The aim mainly is to ensure that the advertising of the product offers uh, true, understandable, and non misleading information, and also that it includes a uh, prominent warning on the associated risks of the of crypto assets. Uh, crypto assets are defined in line with application included in MICA, so uh, they are defined as a uh, digital representation of value, a uh, right or an asset that can, be, that can be transferred or stored electronically using distributed ledger technologies, DLT, or some other technology. So this new circular mainly defines the rules on the content and format of the advertising. In, the, in this regard, the content must be, as I said, clear, balanced, fair, and non-misleading, and it must include manda uh, 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 the following mandatory uh, warnings. So this warning says, investments in crypto assets are not regulated, they may not be appropriated for retail investors, and the full amount invested may be lost. So this uh, warning is uh, in line with all the statements that have been published by European and national uh, supervisors, ESMA, EIOPA, FDA, and national supervisors in, in Spain. For let's say the past two years, especially since the pandemic started, as there was an increase at that moment on the transactions with crypto assets by these investors, as we were all uh, home. So this warning uh, has been uh, continued very relevant by the, by the CNMB. We'll have to wait for the for regulation and maybe the circular might be modified uh, regarding this specific aspect. Uh, also, the circular establishes a mandatory procedure for prior communication to the CNMB of mass advertising campaigns addressed to 100,000 uh, people or more and it establishes certain tools 
um, and procedures to make the supervision of the advertising activity uh, possible and effective, and supervision of this activity is, uh, has been given to the, to the CMP. So this circular does not address or does not regulate the issuance of the classes and the services related to, to them. This has been uh, or have been partially addressed through public statements by the by the CNMB, where the CNMB has given certain criteria, for instance, in relation to the difference between a security token and a utility token, clarifying that security tokens would fall under the scope of Liquid 2 and the rest of regulation dealing with financial instruments. And, and also the CNMB also has clarified that due to our securities market law, uh, and, and blockchain, neither is possible to negotiate security tokens in regulated markets or NPX, or nor to negotiate uh, security tokens that are uh, financial instruments in non-regulated uh, platforms. So uh, as far as, as next steps, as it has been mentioned, I think next steps are at European Union, have to be considered at European Union level, I think uh, there are a lot of important challenges, but I would outline two of them. First, the application of regulation on a private regime for market infrastructures based on DLT. This regulation was published in, in June, and uh, it tries to promote uh, a kind of European sandbox for market infrastructures where security tokens are negotiated using DLT. And of course, I think the second, second important step and big challenge is NICA, the European Markets and Crypto Assets Regulation, uh, when it is approved. And I hope that it will, it will allow uh, all member states to have a common and clear framework regarding um, crypto assets. Thank you so much. Um, I do want to speed up our conversation because we are only left with 13 minutes and we still have to address fully Mika regulation. But before we do that, um, Mr. Calva Sanchez, it was proposed that the disclaimers on the websites are probably going to be changed. So I assume you're also going to be taking care of that. Uh, what is your experience being an in-house lawyer? How do you deal with the regulators? Do you have open conversations? Do you follow up everything they say? <laughs> Stuff like that. <laughs> I mean... My experience or our experience with the regulators is awesome. I mean, obviously they are in front of us, so I cannot say other thing. No, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, no, for real. I mean, they are quite approachable. We have experience with, not just with the Spanish regulators, with the help of NPIC as well, and with the other European countries regulators, and all of them know more that the, most of the industry think that they, they know already. I mean, they are fully aware I mean, you have seen that they know what they are talking about. <laughs> and they, they know what, what is the game about. And they are quite approachable. And obviously, it's not an easy task to approach the regulator, of course. I mean, you have to be prepared, and you have to do your own homework. But it's definitely worth it. At the end of the day, the, the end result, uh, I think, uh, it, uh, it is worth, it's worth it. The, the, uh, I mean, the, the, the hard part of been working uh, on the back on the backstage and uh, be ready uh, to address their questions because I mean obviously again they know what they are talking about and you have to be ready you have to be prepared you have to do your own homework and to know uh, what you want to achieve before approach them um, so pretty much as I said I mean and in terms of regulation I think we are going on on a positive way. But at the end of the day, Mika has taken a lot of time in order to, to be implemented. And the end result, OK, we got a nice base layer, but we have uh, some regulatory approach, uh, regulatory extension to do. And we don't really know how it's going to be applied in certain key issues and key points. So basically looking for a peace of mind. <laughs> oh, again? Looking for a peace of mind. Oh. <laughs> Speaking to lawyers, getting across. All right, thank you for that. Um, and we're going to be turning to Marina Markejic as well. Um, now we're really focusing on Mika. Mm -hmm. So you had plenty of experiences, um, and we're talking to European regulators through this normative process. I'm really curious, what was your experience overall? Were people really approachable? What are the outcomes? Are you satisfied with them? 
Thank you, Anya. So first, I would really like to thank the organizers to um, allow us to co-organize this regulatory panel here. Uh, the first day of the Ethereum conference in the main stage. I'm not sure if you have seen a lot of regulatory panels in these conferences usually, but I think it's just a sign that uh, regulation is a very important topic for us and it is going to be um, much more important in the future. So going back to Mika, uh, Mika will probably be applicable in 2024. So this is the time when most of the projects need to be compliant with Mika. So we have a little bit of time, uh, but still it is important for us to understand what this regulation says and what it means for everyone here that wants to build uh, better products, also uh, in a way a better world uh, on, on better chains. Um, I'm, I'm a co-founder of the European Crypto Initiative, uh, together with my colleague from uh, Spain, uh, sorry, from, from Germany, uh, Florian, and, and from France, Simon. You probably know them, uh, but we approached the European crypto regulators in 2020 when Mika's draft was first issued, and we read it, and when we read it, we said, okay, we need to do something about it. Let's talk to the regulators. Let's say that we have done this work in the previous years on our national levels, and this is where the discussion is starting right now on the EU level. Uh, in the last two years, we have had a lot of meetings with them. I need to uh, say that, um, yeah, I agree with you. Um, Errol, uh, everyone was really approachable. They were uh, very keen to learn more. I remember in 2020, uh, so this was before in a way DeFi was so popular before the DeFi summer, we had a presentation about what DeFi is, what is the market of DeFi, and um, through the whole process, I can say that the draft has changed quite a lot, significantly. Uh, in the last weeks, in the last, yeah, really the last weeks, there's been a lot of discussion about NFTs and how NFTs would be regulated. So in a way, the regulators were looking into what's happening in the market and trying to respond to the best of their capacities uh, to, the, to the actual um, events happening. But we need to understand that this process is very long. It's very complicated. And it also there's a lot of different institutions that are uh, a part of it. Uh, I'm sure that most of you heard about Mika. Uh, so the uh, proof of work ban and also about the transfer funds regulation or the unhosted wallet ban um, in uh, spring this year. This was the time when the parliament was uh, in the process of drafting their own draft. But before that, a lot of work has been done with the commission and also with the council and different member states uh, as for Spain too. And um, so I think that it is very important that the community is aware of what's happening, that we have a dialogue with regulators uh, because we can achieve, uh, and I think, yeah, many things by, by, by talking to them. Um, we see it each, our organization as a kind of a translator, uh, translating our language and what we do uh, and the initiatives and the projects, the ideas to the regulators and vice versa. And I would just uh, finalize my thoughts by looking in the future and seeing how first Mika will be implemented. Uh, it's a regulation, so it will be directly applicable to all the member states. It's not a directive, so not, uh, there's not going to be a specific time uh, that, that the member states need to take in order to implement it. Uh, but at the same time, there's going to be a lot of power in the hands of the national authorities that are going to give uh, grant licenses to, um, to different projects. And they might also have a say to what is decentralized, what is a DAO, what's not a DAO. Uh, we're going to say, see how this is going to work. Of course, the finalized draft is not published yet, so there might be also uh, you know, uh, things that might not be uh, finalized from, from what you can see online today. Uh, but that's very important. And then the next thing is um, there's been rumors about regulating DeFi, um, also from different international organizations like IOSCO, 
Uh, the Bank of International Settlements has, has written about it. Uh, FATF, of course, is always looking into what's happening with the crypto transactions. So all of those things require a lot of knowledge and a lot of work. Uh, and of course, a dialogue with, with all the regulators. I have a million questions. <laughs> <laughs> First, just to clarify, I know this question is not on the list, but I think it's important one, especially because there's plenty of NFTs as on this conference. Um, are NFTs excluded or included in Mika? Briefly, or? Yeah, they are excluded. Mm -hmm. cool. uh, but of course, the devil is in the details and we'll know the details quite soon, uh, but they need to be unique. So I also invite my other uh, co-panelists to comment on this, but the uniqueness is quite important here. Um, and um, yeah, they are excluded. Yeah, I, um, well, I would like to uh, point one, one, question, one aspect you have uh, signaled. I do believe in the council, we have had quite a, an active discussion with the sector because as you said, for regulators, it was also very complicated to regulate this ecosystem because when we first draft Mika, we were not talking about DeFi. N NFTs weren't as important as they are now. No. So people were asking, why is this taking so much time? The problem is that every day we were get, getting updated, so not updated. Mm. So for us, it has been quite a headache to launch a regulation which covered the whole ecosystem, but at the same time that didn't in some uh, way uh, limit the developments in technology. And this has caused us many headaches. Two of these headaches have been DEFI, how to regulate DEFI. Mm -hmm and the second one, NFTs. And as you said, from the council, um, our proposal was to exclude NFTs. Uh, we do believe that there are some NFTs that should be regulated because they are financial instruments, yeah. or maybe they fall into the categories of Mika. But so saying unique and non-fungible tokens, tokens which apply to the art industry, etc., they should be out of Mika because um, at the end, a uh, regulation should be technologically neutral. And there is still going to be a debate on this. So we just uh, reached a political agreement, but there's a lot of discussion which will come uh, in, the, in, in the previous, in the next uh, months. In the commission, uh, there will be a lot of discussion around DEFI, as you said, and also about NFTs and all member states, we will be taking part in these discussions and uh, keeping up to date with all the different developments in the industry in order not to get behind with regulation. I'd like to add here that <coughs> the fact that NFTs are excluded from Mika doesn't mean that NFTs are not regulated. Yeah. I mean, because uh, some, sometimes people tend to think, look, if, if I prepare NFTs, if I somehow design my, my crypto in a way they are unique and so on, I'm, I'm not regulated. That's not the case. Mm -hmm. I mean, if we are talking about art, this, we have intellectual property law, we have uh, anti-money laundering, anti -money laundering laws, uh, tax laws, of course. So what I mean is uh, the fact that this is out of Mika doesn't mean uh, there's no need to pay attention to regulation because for sure there will be some regulation applicable. So we need to have more of these types of conversations all the time? Absolutely. Next year? Okay. <laughs> any final closing remarks? Um, any advice to people sitting in front of you? Well, if, may I say? Is, is something, it's because I really have to say this. Um, we are always talking about regulating NFTs, and at the end of the day, NFTs are no more than, or when we are talking NFTs, it's not more than a medium. Uh, I mean, it's a, like, I want to regulate, I don't know, CDs or DVDs. I mean, uh, at the end of the day, it's just a medium, and it depends what you do with that, and what are the capabilities of the, a particular uh, thing that you are putting on that NFT and the way that you are using that NFT. Uh, so everybody's kind of talking, how do we relate NFTs? I mean, well, I mean, what, what are you going to do with that NFT? What are the value that uh, that NFT and why, why the people is buying that NFT? Or how do you sell that NFT? I think that is the most relevant thing. And I don't care if I'm speaking about NFTs, gold coins, or I don't know, whatever you want to, to sell. And uh, it's, it's funny to me that like, everybody's kind of, how do we relate to NFTs? NFTs is a, it's a standard, it's a protocol and it has been here for four years already. So, I mean, 
that nothing changed with that. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, I thank you for all the answers. If there's going to be any questions, I believe um, there's going to be contacts or there's going to be a possibility to direct somehow those questions. Um, I'm pretty sure that we're going to be all open to answer any type of questions that are going to be particularly um, reserved for regulations or laws. So thank you again for coming, for taking the time. It has been a real pleasure having you on the stage and talking to you. Um, and thank you everybody for listening. Thank you. Yeah.